um, which require a little bit more of that social finesse. Um, and then lastly, we'll talk about the things that you can do, right? Uh, you know, so much of credential-based attacks come down to uh, user training, you know, good password management, complex passwords, and just getting your users not to click on things, um, or just not clicking on things as a, you know, I say your users, but I'm just as, as susceptible as anybody else. Um, and that's great, and you should invest in that training, or those trainings and tools and things like that, but it's not the only thing. Uh, you gotta protect people from themselves, uh, so to speak. Um, so a couple of, you know, a couple of statistics. I don't think this is gonna be surprising um, to anyone, and it's gonna be a little bit of a theme in the earlier part of the presentation is as, as important as your credentials are, or credentials are to an end user, you would think it would get more, you know, time and attention, complexity. You know, essentially people would be as pre protective as, of their, you know, computer logon information as they would their bank account information. You would think that's the case, but it's not the case, uh, reinforced by um, some of these statistics. The second bullet there, and I'll get into in the next couple of slides as to why that is, you know, why, is, why are two thirds of attacks credential based and only one third of, of attacks maybe, you know, more exploit driven or, you know, leveraging, um, you know, some sort of a vulnerability on a, on a host. Um, and then as you see, just kind of reinforcing those numbers, the number of, the percentage of high profile data breaches, the things that you see in the, in the news, um, have a lot more to do with uh, credential compromise, or that was a big piece of that particular um, part of the attack, um, than just simply leveraging um, you know, host vulnerabilities. Um, so who's being targeted? Um, if you look at the actual staff itself, um, probably not surprising. So, so IT staff comprises 44% of those credentials that are, that are targeted. Um, on the one hand, you're thinking from an attacker standpoint, like wouldn't, wouldn't that be the most you know, secure, right? The most complicated, um, you know, those particular users would, would take it much, seri much more serious. But then if you look at the other side, it's they also have the most access, right? IT credentials are gonna have way more access than the, you know, than the general end user would have. Uh, so it makes sense. Um, finance staff, obviously you're targeting, you know, some of the most sensitive type of information. Um, and the one, uh, or the type of information that is most easiest to sort of hold hostage, I guess, or something that like at a board level you're gonna care about, financial information. Uh, and then just senior, you know, executive staff and the CEO and CFO. Um, you know, by far, email is the, you know, the most common um, delivery mechanism for, for an attack, uh, particularly one where you're trying to get um, credentials from somebody. We'll walk, we'll walk through why that is. All right, so before we get into kind of the, you know, the why of why would an attacker focus on um, compromising somebody's credentials instead of just working on an exploit that is much more repeatable you know, to, to compromise a host, you'd have to take a step back and sort of understand what in, in, in our terms would be the attack life cycle. So not talking about credential-based attacks, but just talking about um, leveraging an exploit, so a kind of a standard attack you know, that takes advantage of a vulnerability on a host. Uh, there's a number of, of steps that an attacker would have to go through. Um, the first is, you know, they gather intelligence, they're planning, like, how am I going to get into this network? Am I going um, to target this particular, am I going to target the data center? Am I going to target the DMZ? I need to learn information. Obviously, I need to gather IP addresses and things. I, I need to learn some element of topology of the network that I'm trying to compromise. And that takes time. It takes time to do that and really, um, you know, think about your attack. Now in the early stages, you might actually learn a little bit more of what types of hosts are out there. And then you kind of dig into the pocket and you think, okay, well, which, which exploit am I going to leverage to compromise you know, this particular machine? Um, once I can gain access to that machine, I can execute the malware that, that uh, takes advantage of that vulnerability. Um, once I'm inside, I establish a command and control channel you know, with you know, wherever my, you know, wherever my infrastructure is that's going to gather information about where I'm at on the network or where I'm, uh, where I'm trying to move. Um, once I establish the information that I'm looking for, I can start exfiltrating that data out to uh, my command and control uh, network. At a very sort of rudimentary and, you know, simple level, that's sort of the different 
uh, stages of an attack or something that we would refer to as the attack lifecycle. Um, the reason that credential phishing is so important is you kind of, for the attacker, you skip to the end. So a little bit more work up front, a little bit more finesse up front in terms of trying to understand. So in, in, in terms of planning your attack, you're more focused on, you know, what are, the, what are the types of things, what are the interests of the people that I'm targeting, how could I put together some sort of an email or a campaign or something that is likely going to get a click you know, on that email. Or even better, I get the click, I go to a website, and then I capture the credentials. Um, so for the attacker, a little bit more planning up front, you get to go, you know, directly to the end where I'm, you know, compromise, I can start, exfil or, um, start removing data, um, and at the same time, I can repeat that process so much easier now because I have credentials. And if I'm targeting, for the most part, you know, IT staff, those credentials, that payback is going to be a lot more lucrative. If I can compromise IT or executive staff credentials, what I can then do with those credentials is going to be a lot more lucrative to me as, as an attacker. Um, okay, um, real quick, before I move on, it is, um, it's also good to kind of understand what, you know, I think, you know, I'd like to say that you know this room is a room full of uh, good people, right? We're on the good side of this, uh, you know, this back and forth. But it's very important that we understand kind of what we're up against, and what we're up against is an adversary that is highly sophisticated, um, highly organized, and highly automated. And all of those things, coupled with you know a decline, a low and continuing to de decline cost of computing power makes for um, a very difficult adversary. Uh, because for the most part in cybersecurity, what we are armed with are um, you know, a lot of people-driven protection, right? A lot of manual responses to different things that we see, so not so the opposite of automation. Um, very people-driven, which is also very expensive, right? So we too have access to the declining cost of compute, but what we don't have access to is like a declining cost of people. Uh, and people do not move as fast as machines. So that's, that's sort of the adversary that you're up against. So if you think about, if you, if you break open you know, a credential-based attack, you also have to imagine that times like a million, right? And every time you try to make a maneuver as you know, the good person, right, um, your adversary has already outmaneuvered you, you know, a thousand times over because very sophisticated, very organized and automated, you know, attacker. So as I get into, you know, sort of understanding the, you know, the reason for credentials or the financial gain and all that, and we kind of get to towards the latter part, you know, what we'll ultimately get to is a way in which we can combat that highly automated adversary with the same type of um, automation, you know, global organization of, of data and, and that sort of thing. So that has a little bit of a, little bit of a backdrop. All right, so um, how attackers steal credentials. Uh, social engineering we'll get into. Um, well, I'll, I'll cover it when we get to the slide. Um, credential phishing, we'll talk a little bit about that. We'll dig in a lot deeper. Um, reusing stolen passwords or shared credentials. So like I said, when it comes to IT staff, you know, that's sort of like the golden key, right? Because then you could reuse that against uh, not just that person's, you know, individual workstation and whatever data might be on that. Um, but because they're part of the IST staff, their credentials are going to get you into a lot of doors um, from a you know from a uh, host base perspective. Um, brute force attacks that all comes down to just like good like password uh, hygiene, and then security question reuse. Um, got a couple of these are comical just because I think we all you know see and you know and know these things. Um, social engineering. So um, I don't run into this as as much at least with IT staff because they're a little bit more protective, a little bit more savvy when it comes to this type of thing. But, you know, think of the phone call that you get. Um, you know, think of, you know, ways in which, like if you could, if you could get somebody, um, what's a good example? So I, you know, I, I call you at work and I say, hey, this is your, you know, this is your bank. Looks like there's been some fraudulent activity. I need to verify that activity. If you give me your password, you know, um, then I can get in and, and help you with that. You know. Unfortunately, people are going to fall for that without any more, you know, without any more depth or detail. But think about if I spend a little bit more time understanding who you bank with, 
you know, the types of places that you shop or the types of places that you go or, or whatever, then that phone call or that, um, you know, that engagement with the end user might be a little bit harder to discern, you know, good from bad, right? So my bank at SunTrust, you know, hello, Mr. Schultz. Um, this is SunTrust Bank. We noticed that you know, a couple of fraudulent, you know, charges. You know, maybe I take a trip to, you know, today I'm in Florida. We noticed that you've been down to Florida. We, you know, see a couple of fraudulent charges. In order to reset that, I need your PIN. You know, I need your password. So think of that in terms of social engineering. You've got a person or someone in an organization that you're targeting and you take some time to learn a little bit more about their likes and dislikes, their interest and that sort of thing and then you put together a campaign um, that tries to get them to divulge that information. So think about that when you think of, you know, just kind of old school social engineering. Um, so you can do that and then the more sophisticated attacker would then, instead of that phone call, you, you would send an email, right? And that email would say, Mr. Schultz, fraudulent activity, please click here to reset your password. Oh my gosh, fraudulent activity, I don't want anybody taking my money. You click there, you go to a web page, and this is where the training and the hygiene, and there's tools out there and all, all kinds of things, right, to help the end user discern good from bad. How do I know this is legit? I mean, it, it sounds like it's for me. I mean, this is my bank. This is the type of, these are the types of places that I go and, you know, things like that. But, how, you know, how do I know this is for me? You know, the savvy user, right, is going to go up here and, they're, you know, maybe they'll catch it in the, in the URL or they'll hover over the link before they click on it or something like that. Um, but that's inconsistent at best, right? It's very, very inconsistent. And even with, you know, something like Office 365 or some of these other you know, SaaS-based applications, the URL isn't always that straightforward, right? It might have like your organizational name mixed in, you know, somewhere with some other obscure, you know, domain that you don't really recognize even though it's legit. Um, so the user clicks on this and what's the first thing it asks for? It asks for your old password so that you can reset it to the new password. So the first thing you do is you type in your old password, which is your current password, and you just have been compromised. Um, looking forward a little bit to kind of the, you know, the, the latter part of the presentation, um, this is an example of using automation and using um, global intelligence to help fight this battle. Uh, because as you know, leaders within cybersecurity, one of the things that we can do is leverage technology. The, the, the technology knows that's a bad URL. Uh, the technology can go even further. So if you think about artificial intelligence and machine learning, um, the right types of solution can actually parse through this web page and notice that you know, uh, you know, the graphics are not really the resolution that, you know, the standard, let's say, Office 365 website is going to use. Or they're going to they're gonna look at things like, you know, I've seen a hundred different um, uh, load requests, HTTP requests, get requests for the Office 365 landing page. And the files were, you know, it was this, you know, let's say 10 files to build the page. And each file was this, you know, this large and whatever. So they can come up with a fingerprint of an authentic web page. And when you have a fingerprint of what the right thing is, it's very easy to discern or it's very easy to pull out what the wrong thing looks like. So that's where you can kind of turn the odds back in your favor is against a highly, audit highly automated adversary, you're, the cards are stacked against you. If you've got technology in place that's helping you baseline what normal looks like or what good looks like um, and that sort of thing, then it's very easy to determine what bad looks like. Uh, and that's just as an example with this particular website, right? Like, you know, technology can help with the domain, parsing through the domain, is this legit or not, or does this fall into a category of something that you know, a cloud provider would determine as high risk? Was this domain just registered you know, this morning? You know, it can parse through all of that, put it in a category of, you know, command and control or malware or phishing or something like that. So it can kind of help the end user protect them from themselves. How else did they do it? This is uh, pretty straightforward. Um, you get the, uh, the credentials for, uh, you know, for Sue. She's an IT administrator or she belongs to the finance department or she's a senior level, you know, person within the organization. They're going to have access not just to a you know, diverse set of systems and applications, but they're also gonna have deeper and more highly valued access to the information that's on those hosts. I think that's pretty straightforward. Um, and we've talked about that already. Uh, brute force. So this is where um, I, was, uh, I was fortunate to be able to reuse the slide. So I took the content 
from, uh, we have an organization, a threat research organization within Palo Alto Networks called Unit 42. Um, you know, I took a lot of the content from a white paper that she wrote, um, I think it was about six months ago. So it's posted on our, on our website, which is great, but I said, hey, I'm, you know, I'm gonna be delivering a talk. Do you have this in like PowerPoint or Google Slides or something like that? And she sent, fortunately she did. She sent this to me and I thought this was one of her better slides, so I took that from her. Um, but brute force, this comes down to, um, you know, what I'd say used to, used to just be about password complexity. Um, you know, obviously when you're talking about passwords, I think, you know, multi-factor authentication comes into the conversation. And that was sort of like the answer, right? Like if we could just, you know, make sure that that's the actual person and use some other device or some other mechanism to authenticate that that's the person and not just somebody with stolen credentials. Um, but just like anything, right? You know, not, not only is that adversary um, highly automated and sophisticated, they're also very creative, right? Like they will find you know, the chink in the armor or the, you know, the, the hole that they can leverage to get around, you know, whatever technology that we, that we put in place. Um, so brute force is very much a, you know, password reuse and password complexity, you know, type, type problem or solution to the problem. The next one is, you know, many people forget their password, especially if we're asking them to be more complex. Um, so what might be the easier way to get the, get the password or get the password compromised? Go to the security questions. You know, maybe, that, maybe I can answer that. What city were you born? Well, I know this person. Or it's on the bio, on their executive website, where they were born, where they went to school, you know, whatever. I could, I could potentially reset or compromise a password just, just answering his or her security questions. Um, I, this is another, obviously all the ones with the comic strip are the ones that I took from, uh, uh, from the Unit 42 author, but uh, um, you know, this one is just as true as ever. And unfortunately, you know, despite me working in the industry and um, you know, trying my best, I, I think my parents are still using like the pet security question <laughs> password reset thing from like a decade ago. Um, and it's just, you know, uh, it's just training to some degree, you know, obviously if you're ever compromised or somebody ever gets your credentials, that's the wake up call, right? You never really, you don't understand that you need insurance until you really, you know, have an event and you, you figure out that you need it, you know, sort of thing. So unfortunately for a lot of users, that's, that's part of the problem. Um, pretty straightforward here. What do they, you know, what do they do with it? Um, focus in on the lateral movement for a second, because if you go back to that attack life cycle from the beginning, um, you know, once I get in, I may not even care about, you know, the, the, the machine that I'm on like the, the machine that was compromised. It might even be like a, like a printer, right? Like we see that all the time. IoT devices being that first landing spot where an exploit is, is leveraged. And then from there, because you're, you know, essentially you're inside, inside the network, lateral movement becomes, um, becomes much more high risk, right? Because um, I'm in the protected part of the network, I move laterally, and I just go from system to system using the credentials I've got you know, maybe compromising more and more credentials. I get to a system, I realize it's not the type of, of access that I really wanted. So I keep hopping around, more, gathering more and more credentials, moving laterally throughout the organization, establishing a command and control channel um, until I eventually get to what I need, right? Until I eventually get to what I need. Um, the one statistic, I'm not sure if it was on that, uh, that original slide, um, but the percentage of attacks that leveraged a vulnerability, a lot of times an administrative vulnerability, not in, a, not in a software kind of way, but a vulnerability in terms of a misconfiguration. Uh, so inside an organization, those are bad. Deploying to the cloud and having an administrative issue, real bad, really bad. Because now I've just taken my data from a, a place that I've somewhat protected inside my organization and I've just moved it out to the public web uh, where everybody can just kind of bang away on the, on the door. Right, so cloud access is becoming more and more um, or more lucrative than, uh, than maybe what it, what it used to be as more and more moves to the cloud. All right, uh, we talked about this a little bit already. The phishing email goes to the victim. Credentials get sent to that, if you remember back to that Office 365. So just kind of you know, envision that in your head. Credentials are sent to the phishing page. The adversary navigates through the network, accessing critical applications with stolen credentials. Uh, that might be a repeat. Here we go. 
Uh, so a couple of recommendations, um, or a few recommendations, and I'm gonna go into um, you know, a couple of them in a little bit more detail. Um, Multi-factor authentication, very important. Um, you know, one of the challenges with multi-factor authentication, especially in, in older applications, has been you know, their native support for MFA. Um, and so we have you know, kind of something, that, something to think about, I guess, in terms of um, how to get around that. Um, obviously, automation is, is really key, very important. Um, password managers, I would, I would assume a lot of people are familiar with those. Those are gaining in popularity. User education, I'm not gonna spend that much time on the password managers and user education. If you have any questions about that or wanna dig in deeper, just come see me after the presentation. Where I really wanna focus you know, the rest of this is what you can do from a technology standpoint, what you can do from an automation standpoint to help combat these, uh, these types of attacks. I don't think there's a lot to say here. Uh, like I said, we're gonna dig into the credential phishing and the multi-factor authentication. Um, you know, password managers are gonna help you with the, with the weak password problem. Um, obviously, then you get into securing the password manager. Um, and it all comes down to, you know, in the end, the, you know, the end user and their ability to secure the passwords no matter how strong they are. So let's kind of walk through this attack again. Excuse me. Um, phishing emails goes to the victim. Try to take away any product-related stuff out of this because I wanted it to be as transferable as, as possible, right? We, like, we are not the only providers. I think the way we do it is unique in the industry, but we're not the only providers of some of these, you know, some of these solutions. Um, but think about the power if you had a, so let's talk about the, uh, the organization of the attacker. So how would you combat a highly organized attack community? Well, you'd have to combat that with some level of organization yourself. So if there's a lot of data sharing, right, whether that's exploit mechanisms, passwords, I mean, you know, all of these breaches that make it to the paper, all those username and passwords are freely available out there on the web, right, if you just know where to look. Um, so from an attack community, you have all this organization, right? There's, um, there's repeatable kind of playbooks or even software for different compromises that can be traded and sold online and all kinds, so it's just very organized say that. So if you were going to combat, you know, malicious organization with good organization, what, what would that look like? Um, well, you'd need a lot of visibility across a global population of networks and end user traffic. So you need visibility. And, you know, one of the things that I would say, so let's, sorry, I'll take one more step back. Um, if there were four things that you could do to prevent most attacks, what would they be? Number one would be you need to have visibility to what it is, the traffic, or what it is that you're trying to protect. Um, number two, you'd have to find ways to reduce your attack service. So if there's a highly susceptible you know, version of Windows file sharing protocol, but there's a less susceptible or more secure version of Windows file sharing or Microsoft file sharing, Reducing my attack surface would say, well, I don't use version one, I use version two or version three. Um, so that'd be one example. Or if I've got a highly, um, a very important segment of my, of my data center, of my network, um, I would put something in place that would prevent or at least gain more visibility to any sort of attempt of lateral movement. Right? So that'd be one way I could reduce my attack surface. So that even if somebody got in, I have different ways that I could reduce the damage that that, that person could, could make. So, I, so those four things, again, are, you know, I need to have visibility, I need to have, um, uh, I need to have ways of reducing my attack surface. You know, obviously, it's, it's very, it, it has become very low cost or lower cost technology to be able to prevent all known exploits, right? That's one of the areas where the declining cost of compute actually helps us as the good guys, good girls, is being able to look at traffic on the network and determine, like, I already know about that exploit, I'll just stop it, right? Like, I see this, this attempt happening, I'll just stop it, right? So if you can filter out all the noise, right? All the, all the lazy attackers that are just reusing um, exploits that the industry has known about for a while, just, just do that, right? If that's 90% if that's of your problem or 95% of your problem, just do that, right? Have technology in place that does it. 
so that if you have a new machine you know, join the network or an outdated machine or maybe you've got some technology in your organization that relies heavily on a you know, real-time version of Windows XP or whatever it is, put the technology in place um, to protect those things. So preventing known attacks. And then the last thing is preventing unknown attacks. So that's the fourth piece. So you have to have some, some type of mechanism, you know, some, some way of determining whether or not this thing that I see is good or bad. And you don't want to figure that out on your own. Um, number one, the technology exists, and it's the, you know, the cost of that technology has, has become quite affordable. Um, but you also don't want the risk. You don't want the risk of having to build some sort of an environment or have a virtual machine running in your data center that is responsible for opening up things that you don't know are good or bad, and then having to make, a, you know, make some sort of a verdict. So where I'm going with all this is you know, this particular thing, when you see wildfire, what that is, so pretend it doesn't say wildfire, and I'll just describe it to you. What that is, is a global, and it's a cloud-based, you know, global repository for the verdicts of things that are good or bad. So imagine, you know, if, if I'm the attacker and I'm trying to reuse, you know, some of this repackaged, you know, exploit kits or whatever, I'm trying to reuse those things, if I've got a, an advanced, you know, highly scalable, real-time database, essentially, or service, where if I try to use that kit to exploit you know, this customer A over here, it might even be in a completely different part of the country, completely different part of the world. And I've got the capability of the first time I see that, I send it up to this service, I make a verdict. The entire global you know, population of individuals, it doesn't even have to be everybody, right? But enough people within that subscribe to this service immediately know about that exploit. And that moves from the unknown column into the known column. And I've got technology in place that stops all known attacks, right? Why would I ever expect to see that on the network? Um, that's what I mean in terms of using, you know, looking at the attack community that's highly organized and fighting that with organization in addition to automation. So anybody sees something, you know, malicious, um, there's a number of different ways, you know, that we can determine if something is malicious uh, based on, you know, software or whatever or what it's trying to do, what it's trying to do on the host, what it's trying to do on the network. Uh, and then, you know, within minutes, I've got a, everybody is up to date on now that exploit. It goes a long way in terms of fighting automation and organization with the same thing. Um, so that's, so in this particular scenario, that's as if I sent like a file that had an embedded thing in it or whatever. I would, I would send that to the service. They would, you know, look at that file and give me a verdict. Do you want to open that or not, you know? Um, the other way, when you see the term PanDB, um, think of the URL. So we go back to that credential phishing attack with the Office 365, you know, splash screen, and that URL. So, so think of that same concept in terms of de de deciding whether or not this file is m benign or malicious. So think of that same concept. What if I want to know if this particular URL is benign or malicious, or what category is it in? So. Um, in some instances, these, you know, these solutions have been in place to keep people from, you know, spending too much time on Facebook, you know, or spending too much time on ESPN or something like that. I want to know where my users are going on the internet, and maybe I want to filter what they can get to. Uh, sometimes in, you know, schools, it's a compliance, you know, issue. Um, so the idea of capturing, you know, URLs and reporting against, you know, what users are accessing, that's not a new concept. But think about it against... Um, what I mentioned just before about this global, um, highly sophisticated and highly organized, you know, population of, you know, good people um, sharing information. And now I can classify not just URLs based on, you know, is it a business application? Is it productivity software? Is it social networking? Um, but now I know whether or not that URL is, you know, is it, has it been seen somewhere else as a part of a phishing campaign, part of a malware delivery campaign? Uh, part of a, is it part of a command and control, you know, known uh, IPs or domains? Uh, and then if it's not known, so maybe I want to measure some other things, like was it just created? Because like, like why would a user be putting in their credentials to a domain that's just been created and all that? They don't know, you know. They, the, the end user doesn't know this. But this is why I say the technology can help, you know, protect them from themselves. So 
this idea of a, you know, a sandbox or, or something like that to handle things that you don't know about, you don't want that in your environment. You want that up in the cloud. You want that to be somebody else's responsibility. Number one, they've got the information to be able to determine whether it's good or bad. And if it's bad, you don't want the risk of it being you know, in-house you know, sort of thing. Likewise, with URL categorization, you want that service to be out in the cloud, updated in real time, and shared across a global population of, um, of professionals. Um, so back to this slide. So user gets the email, they click on the link uh, because the training hasn't worked, they've got a bad habit, maybe there was something really enticing, you know, the, the attacker did some really good social engineering to understand what their likes and dislikes were. They click on the, on the link and, you know, it's intercepted because either the URL or what they were trying to download has already been, it's already been seen and it's already been determined that that's bad. I feel like that, did that jump ahead? Okay, here we go. Talked about that, okay. Here's the next, um, so the next step in this is, um, so if you have those tools at your disposal, we can detect, or we can determine whether or not something, something that we don't know, we can determine whether it's good or bad. But specific to credential phishing, we can determine whether or not um, the URL that they're going for, going to, is you know good or bad, you know to a uh, uh, high level of confidence. Even better, if we have technology in place that sees that an end user is trying to exchange or or enter their credentials in a place that we know that they shouldn't be, as you know the you know the the folks charged with protecting the user from themselves, um, and this is where the technology can help you again. So. I'm not interested or, or technology doesn't have to know your password. In order to see that you're trying to enter your credentials, the combination of a username and password, with, you know, at a site or in a URL category that maybe is unknown, it's known bad, or it's got high risk, right? Like it was just created or, or whatever. So here's kind of another step in that, in that thing. And this is where you can start to use the tools together to get more granular. There might be instances where you want to allow you know, access to um, you know, certain URL categories, but you would never expect to see credentials being exchanged with those particular URLs or URL categories. And this is where sort of the, you know, the layering of, of these different, different features can help. Um, MFA, uh, you know, it's been a topic of a few presentations uh, today, I would just, you know, I would assume we're all using MFA uh, to some degree, and we know what that is. I'll talk to some of the some of the challenges with that. Let's see if it goes one more. Okay. Um, some of the challenges with multi-factor authentication is um, that lack of native integration. So if you've got applications within your data center, particularly homegrown, you know, applications where you've got um, you know, you've got a dedicated repository of usernames and passwords, you know, for those, and they, they haven't yet been natively integrated into multi-factor authentication. Um, there are tools out there or solutions out there that will sort of front end those things for you and think about it in terms of, you know, being incorporated into these other features that we've talked about that would, um, that would be able to enforce multi-factor authentication even if, the, if, even if the application doesn't natively support it. Um, and I think there's a slide in here that talks about how that works. Um, so this is, so we talked about number one, or the, the one on the far left, we talked about the middle one, suspicious credentials um, being blocked. The last piece here is that multi, or policy-based multi-factor authentication enforced at the network layer. So if I'm, if I'm something that's operating at the network layer and I see that um, the user is trying to access an application that doesn't natively support multi-factor authentication or two-factor authentication, um, essentially what I can do is if I'm that device, you know, or if I'm that thing enforcing security controls, you know, all around a good, you know, prevention-based, you know, kind of kind of strategy, um, what I can do is I can challenge the user for. Uh, multi-factor authentication, and, it's in, in, and if I am natively integrated, I challenge, and it's then, uh, if that challenge is passed, 
I can then allow from a network standpoint um, access to that application. So again, just like multiple tools because MFA is a very good thing, we wanna make sure that we're using that. The biggest barrier to deploying MFA everywhere, um, you know, our feedback is, is generally legacy applications or applications that are not yet natively integrated into your, into your MFA solution. It's gonna be easy with email, it's gonna be easy with a lot of SaaS based you know, solutions that are out there, but organizations still have applications on their network um, that don't yet you know, support, support that. It might support SSO, you know, but it doesn't it's not supporting uh, multi-factor authentication yet. So there's a way to do that at the, uh, at the network layer. Um, before I stop and ask for any questions, um, I did wanna just kind of put you know, something, something, something out there, maybe kind of a lead in into, or maybe just a, you know, a punctuation on, the, uh, on that story around you know, fighting automation with automation. And that is um, what used to be Palo Alto Networks is, um, is mostly known as uh, sort of the early adopter or the early creator of a device known as the next generation firewall. And what that device did was pulled together you know, multiple different things, multiple different solutions. Um, so this concept of preventing known attacks using real-time real -time threat prevention. Uh, the idea of URL categorization, obviously in sandbox technology, VPN, all, the, all these different solutions that brought together into a single you know, sort of device or portfolio of devices. And one of the key pieces to that is, well, okay, those things all used to be separate. Um, you know, what is the, you know, what is the benefit of bringing those things together? Why not just keep them separate? Obviously, there's always a cost and complexity, you know, component to that. But automation was the real key. Automation was the, was the key to that. And after, you know, 10 plus years of doing that really well, uh, what we've seen and the way in which the industry has, has evolved is that, this concept of a firewall or a next generation firewall will continue to be a very robust uh, and a very effective prevention oriented device. In order to do good prevention, you've got to have good visibility. So there's technology in there that helps with that. It will continue to be that thing. Um, but it will also, we're kind of in, a, in an area where it will also evolve into, or it's evolving into not just what kind of policy can I implement? What kind of, you know, what kind of traffic can I detect and stop? but it's also evolving into what type of information can I generate and gather from what I'm seeing so that I can leverage things like machine language, or I'm sorry, um, machine learning, machine language, um, artificial intelligence, and other more sophisticated computer-based tools that help me in that automation battle, or that help me in that, in that battle against a highly automated adversary. Um, so if I were to say, you know, going back and trying to summarize the presentation, you know, the reason that um, attackers focus on credentials, you get to skip to the end, it makes it very, very easy and repeatable, you know, for them. Not to say that that's the only type of attack we see, uh, but that's why. It's extremely lucrative for the work up front. Um, there's a number of reasons why. There's a number of features and things and tools that you can do to sort of protect the person from themselves in terms of being you know, socially engineered or credentials being compromised and that sort of thing. Uh, and, and more and more, I guess the, you know, the one takeaway from the presentation, if you could just um, you know, think about, this is not a uh, human problem to solve in that we as people trying to protect you know, the, you know, the, you know, the good side of this fight, um, human beings are not gonna do this by themselves. We have to leverage compute, we have to leverage automation, we have to leverage machine learning. Um, to fight an adversary that's essentially using these same tools. That's the only way that we, that we win, you know, or break even in this battle. Um, so with that, let me open it up. Any, uh, any questions or comments, thoughts? You guys think this is crazy talk? Anything at all? Got 15 minutes. Is this the last session of the day or do you have more sessions to go to? One more, all right. So I'm not getting you to happy hour any sooner by letting you go 15 minutes early. Any thoughts, I'm just shaking heads, like do people agree with this? Is this, is this the right thing? Yeah, question, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's a good question, and you know, there's probably better answers in the room than what I can give you. I, um, you know, there's people, so I'm, I'm fortunate to lead a team of you know, 10 very you know, highly skilled, you know, highly intelligent engineers. And even within that, it usually breaks 50-50. You know, so if, you, if the topic is like Google, right? Oh, I love Google because it makes it so easy. And as an organization, we move to like, you know, G Suite. And there's, there's a lot of efficiency gains by moving to Google. And you get half the team that's like, yeah, but privacy and you know, compromise and like all these other things. And when I have conversations with people, it seems like password managers are kind of the same. You know, so you have some that just really love, you know, the ones that are, you know, stored in the cloud and they trust and, you know, they've got a good story in terms of how they secure, you know, your data. And then you have others that I won't touch the cloud. You know, it's got to be stored on my, my machine and all that. So I don't have a, you know, really a good answer for you other than it seems to be, you know, variable and, and inconsistent across, you know, a lot of people. Yeah. And I mean, does anybody else have a more informed comment or more informed reply than, than mine? Yes, sir. Okay. Gotcha. Is there a particular um, password manager that that mimics that architecture? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? All right. I'll hang around if anybody needs to uh, to chat or anything. But uh, thank you very much. Appreciate it.